welcome to the Wiki Tree Challenge. Hi, I'm Mindy Silva. Welcome to the Wiki Tree Challenge reveal. Today I have Cindy Valdez from the Society of Hispanic Historical and Ancestral Research. Welcome, Cindy. And do you want to tell us who else is with us here today? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have Michael Vega. He's another one of our uh, board members for our group. Um, we also have Irene Foster. Um, Irene is also a board member and she submitted her name and she was one of the ones selected. And I'll let the rest introduce themselves. Uh, we have Jay, who was the captain for the week and, you know, crucial to the success. So, and then Willie, go ahead and tell us who you are. Okay, I'm William Gonzalez, um, um, representing my father, uh, Desiderio Jesse Gonzalez, who um, I <clears throat> introduced to the WikiTree Challenge and uh, so it was so um, so nice to be accepted and uh, participate in the uh, in the WikiTree challenge. Yeah, it was great to hear that you guys had such a wonderful response and so many people that submitted names. I know we limited you to seven, <laughs> so and you know we can only do so much in a week, but um, and we had a lot of fun with it. But it's always nice to hear that you had a really positive response from your organization. Yeah, I did, and um, um, this is all fairly new to me, so it took me some time to navigate my way through the site, and and uh, I'm still still trying to figure out things, but um, I, I did learn a lot as I was going through it, and um, um, it, it was real helpful to have you and everyone else that um, participated and, and helped me along the way, too, and I really appreciated that. Oh, no problem. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about Wikitree first for those viewers that don't know who we are. Our mission is to grow one accurate shared tree that connects us all and is accessible to everyone free forever. It's all about collaboration. There's one profile per person. If you and I share an ancestor, we work on that profile together. It's not that you have your tree and I have my tree. It's all one big global tree. And did I mention it's all free? Now we just passed 34 million profile mile milestone with almost 11 million of those having DNA connections attached to them. So that's been really exciting. And what really makes WikiTree work is its community. A cornerstone of the community is our honor code. So anyone can view profiles on WikiTree, but to edit them, um, you know, anything more than a close family member, you have to sign the honor code. This emphasizes sourcing, giving credit, courtesy, understanding, accessibility, accuracy, and respecting privacy. And privacy is another one of those aspects of WikiTree that make it special. So even though we're growing a one world tree and our, you know, the majority of our site and profiles are free to view, we all collaborate together. Only close family members can work on those modern pro family profiles. So as you go back in time, of course, the pro privacy uh, controls open up collaboration on those deep ancestors is between distant cousins who are serious about genealogical research, careful about their sources, and willing to see their research validated or invalidated. So if you aren't a member yet, come and join. It just takes a minute to register as a guest, and you can delete a guest account at any time. Now, once again, we worked with the Society of Hispanic Historical and Ancestral Research this week, and it was just so much fun. They gave us seven names. We had seven days to find everyone we could within seven degrees of them. And seven degrees means seven steps in any direction. <clears throat> On WikiTree, we call that a person CC7. So our starting people were four Grumbles, who gained 1,253 new relatives, bringing her CC7 to 1,260. Timoteo Moran Milan gained 262 new relatives, bringing his CC7 to 266. Loretto Coronado gained 386 new relatives, bringing his CC7 to 389. Sebastian Constantino de Ars 
gained 209 new relatives, bringing his CC7 to 987. Ramon Lopez gained 163 new relatives, bringing his CC7 to 166. And that was saying something because I know um, our researchers had some difficulties working on that line. So uh, adding 163 was great. We had Francisco Felix Rodriguez, who gained 485 new relatives, bringing his CC7 to 496. And then we had Desiderio, Jesse Gonzalez, who gained 205 new relatives, bringing his CC7 to 402. And here we have a couple of our top people uh, during the challenge week. Now, Guillaume Albacini was our most valuable participant or MVP, but he was also our top bounty hunter this week. Other bounty hunters were Nanette Pizzuti, Homer Thiel, Heather Jenkinson, Aaron Breen, Celia Marsh, Nina Hall, and Ellen Smith. Um, <clears throat> what a great week. And then, of course, we had Jay. Jay, do you want to tell us a little bit about our participants? Sure. Um, we had, I think, last check, it was at least 50 participants. A lot of these are... The, the, the same dedicated genealogists that come to work on, I'm pretty new at this, maybe a year and a half. And this, uh, I think I started the first couple of months at Family Search because that's where I was finding the, the records I wanted from Northern Mexico. And right away, uh, it's amazing how helpful these genealogists are. Um, I was looking for a place other than FamilySearch.org where I need like a, a world tree where real genealogists are and it's just going to be the same tree and not different for each person. In, I found Wikitree, I think it was a little over a year ago. And just about any of these people that you see on this list are just willing to help you and eager, not just willing, eager. Um, and uh, this one, we had 50. Uh, I, I admit it might be a little less than we than we have. People are a little bit of afraid of the, the Mexican records. I can understand yeah. that. Um, but <clears throat> it. It, they really they jump in and try and people bring different strengths to the profiles some people really like to work on biography some people like to search um the i think guillaume is really good at looking for newspaper articles and things like that right is that guillaume that does that i think homer is the one that takes the That's majority it. of them Right. But but you're right. Guillaume did a lot this week, um, and sure he did. found some really wonderful family histories this week that were just a gold mine. And so we these are the fifty people. Um, the, as you can see, if uh, most of us, not all of us, are on Discord online, mostly because of the immediacy of the the feedback. But you can also ask the same questions on their G2G on Wikitree's G2G, which is. Uh, board where you can pose and it, it, people are checking those all the time and rarely do questions go at least not someone doesn't try to answer that and you know jay really hit it on the head when he said that that one of the outstanding things about this community is just how amazingly helpful and friendly people are and very, you know, co very are, collaborative yeah these are these are all volunteers you know so they're just volunteering their time and um, they're doing record translations, they're looking up newspaper articles, they're doing things like that. And, you know, it's it's really, it's a lot of fun to watch. It's very impressive. So we took a look at all of our starting ancestors and we didn't find blood relations, but we did find connections. And that's one of the fun things on Wikitree is being able to see how we're all connected, you know, by blood or marriage. So Cora Grumbles is 16 degrees from Desiderio Gonzalez. Loretto Coronado is 22 degrees from Cora and 25 degrees from Ramon Lopez. Uh, Francisco Rodriguez is connected to the global tree, but he was the only one that had no close connection to the others. So, you know, that just means um, he needs more people added around his location because the more people we add, the more likely we are to decrease those connections and make people clo closer. And only Timoteo was not connected to the global tree this week, but definitely not for the lack of trying. No, that and can still happen. Yeah, people are it still, still working happen. on that. I know I'm still working on that. We really want to get, and meaning what it means by being connected to the family tree is they're kind of like 
sort of like this uh, solo glob out there of connections and we're just trying to get them to where there's an existing tree and they have one connection and then suddenly they're connected to everybody. It's really amazing when you make that connection. Um, it's just, it's kind of fun. It's exciting when you see that and then suddenly you can, it, the, so, I don't know who writes all these apps, but w- there are wiki treeers that are very good code writers and make it all so easy. Uh, I, I just want to mention the uh, extensions on there because that's what really, one of the things that brought me, uh, I come from uh, research, uh, is like I've been doing research most of my life, I'm an attorney, and I really liked how easy, I mean, the first thing was the citations. I mean, that's what I just was, I would struggle over and here it's a click of a button a very accurate citation Mm -hmm. very accurate bios just reading all of your sources um just amazing and wiki treeers just doing it to help the wiki tree uh goal yeah and we do have a lot of fun using this connection finder during the week and you can look at any profile and say what is their relationship to me and it will show you this path like you see in the middle So this is my connection to Loretta Coronado, and it shows you the path used to reach me with three connections being by marriage. And I do have to admit, I usually connect the captain here and show it, but Jay just wasn't connected to any of them. And um, and I tried our our MVP, which was Guillaume, but he wasn't either. So since I seem to be related to almost everybody, I wound up (laughs) using my own connection. Um, Mindy? Yes. In your connections there, uh, my son is an Olmstead, but I'm an Arcee. And we're from Baja, but my son is a Viking type person. And we traced him all the way back to Scotland. Oh, wow. So we're related to you in an off way. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's awesome. Yeah, so they because I saw that Olmstead name and I do you know uh let's see who uh, Frederick Olmstead? Have you heard of him in your family? Uh-uh. He's the one that um was the art- architect for Central Park in New York. Oh, okay. So yeah, I see know, there's a, quite a I see there's quite a few of them in that connection in between. Yeah, the but the I don't let, I don't recognize any of the names. There was a Captain James that was with uh, Washington at Valley Forge and stuff like that. But that's where my connection comes from. But it's the same name, but it's eventually it's spelled differently. Yeah, even on the lines that I have, it started out with an uh, with an L in it, and then it went without the L, and then it went back to the L. So it had mm-hmm. several spellings. Yeah, and but even with an A. Yeah, it goes back, I think, into the nine hundreds with an A. Yeah. Okay, I just thought that was interesting. Yeah, it really is. Once again, you know, we're all connected somehow by blood or marriage. It's just. A uh, matter of whether we get enough profiles added around us that we can find that connection. So it really is a lot of fun. Um, here we have Governor Jose Antonio Romaldo Pacheco Jr. Now he's seven degrees from Sebastian Constantino de Ars. On February 27th, 1875, Governor Pacheco became the state of California's 12th governor its first California-born governor, and its first governor of Mexican ancestry. So, you know, that was definitely a notable person in California's history. And while we're talking, go ahead. I was going to say, that was a good find. Yeah. While we're talking about Sebastian, he's six degrees from California Governor Pio de Jesus Pico, um, be it his nephew, Jose Arce. Now, Pico served as the last Mexican governor of the state of Alta, California, prior to the Mexican-American War. And I think Sebastian wound up really being um, related to a number of these politicians. It was interesting. So here we have another one, but even larger. We continue uh, on and we look at U.S. presidents and Sebastian who served in Baja, California, Mexico, of course, is 14 degrees from the 32nd president of the United States, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. 
and 15 degrees from um, Hiram Ulysses Grant. And then finally, someone from other than Sebastian, we have Cora Grumbles, who is 10 degrees from William Harry, Henry Harrison, who was the ninth president of the United States. Now, he was an American military officer and politician and the first president to die in office. And, you know, once again, it's just so fun. And WikiTree does, um, you know, like Willie said, there's so much to learn when you first get in there, but it does make it easy to find these connections. And, you know, you can go out to these categories and say, okay, I want to see how I'm related to all the U.S. presidents. You go to that category and click on my connections and it'll tell you what, if you're related to any of them. And if not related, it'll show you what your connections are. And we have thousands of categories. <laughs> so really easy to find something that's interesting. So now we'll take a look at something other than um, just the interesting finds and connections. And we'll start with Cora Grumbles. And we were told by that Cora and two siblings were adopted by Dolores Cisneros. So this is stuff we were provided by at the start of the week. And, you know, this really took a lot of research. And we talked a lot about this throughout the week. And it turned out that Dolores, uh, who adopted her, had a very complex family. So the three children that she adopted were partially her own. Now, Cora was born out of wedlock. She may or may not have been the child of Jefferson Grumbles or his brother, um, but she was a child belonging to Dolores. Mary, who's counted as one of the adopted children, was actually Dolores's younger half-sister sharing a mother with her. And then William, was a child of Dolores's, but his father was William Norman, and he was born out of wedlock also. You know, and times were different back then, so it may have just been easier for her to say, oh, these are my adopted children, without going into specifics, you know, and disclosing family secrets. And it was just, you know, a, a nicer, simpler thing to say, oh, these children were all adopted, um, but none of them actually were. Two were hers and one was a sibling. So uh, definitely, you know, something to look into more. Now, we did find a birth record, and the birth record that matches Cora's birth date has Maria Emma, which, of course, anybody looking into Hispanic um, ancestry, uh, Maria is a very, very common uh, proper first name, along with whatever the child is called. <clears throat> but... Um, you know, it could also be that because Dolores took this, these had these three children listed as her adopted children, she couldn't have two daughters that were Mary. And so instead of having a Mary, a Mary and, you know, a William, um, they called Maria Emma, they called her Cora. And that was most likely after Jefferson's sister, which seemed to be a family name in that family, which is what makes us think that, um, you know, that was the reason she was given the Grumbles name, uh, that that may be the father. So, of course, DNA testing is going to be needed to prove the validity of that and check that out. But those really were, you know, the two men, um, him and it, or his brother, were the ones that seemed to fit the most as the father. And once again, that name Cora was uh, a family name for them. And so that may be where that came from. Now on to other interesting connections. Our researchers, they found a lot for the relatives of Cora and it was really hard to pick who to showcase. They find all these things out throughout the week and then we have to narrow it down to who we wanna show. So I decided to start with Bonifacio Baca. And in 1881, he was a witness for the prosecution in the trial of Billy the Kid for the 1878 shooting of Sheriff William Brady. A recently discovered photo alleged to be a Billy the Kid was said to have belonged to Bonifacio and has been passed down through the um, that family huh. and uh, belonged to his son. And here's where you can see the connection. So, you know, we can once again take anybody and say, how is this person connected to that person? 
here is uh, Bonifacio's connection to poor Grumbles, and that's by uh, four degrees via her half brother, George Norman. Another one our researchers found was Jose Guadalupe Gallegos, who married to Josefa Gutierrez, just four months shy of his 16th birthday in 1843. Now, area censuses uh, indicated that they had six children. He was a native New Mexican military leader, a county sheriff, a rancher, and a politician. So he was pretty important in his community and really well involved. He was only 23 years old when he was elected and served as sheriff for San Miguel County, New Mexico. Um, the sheriff's office was located in Las Vegas, New Mexico, a town known to harbor the most disreputable game of gam uh, gang of gamblers, desperados, and outlaws. And so, you know, it was a pretty wild area. And he was later elected and served in four of the six assemblies of the territorial legislature between 1855 and 1861. He was also one of the founding members of the Historical Society of New Mexico. And, you know, he founded several other companies, um, mining companies, a wool manufacturing company. Now, he was only 39 years old when he was reported as drowned following a mysterious, uh, mysterious carriage accident on May 18th hmm. of 1867. So that picture, if you can see it, is the newspaper article, um, and the image was actually provided of his carriage crash. Jose is six degrees from Cora Grumbles via her husband, Acasio Gallegos. And then a quick mention to Minnie Luella Dalton. She's three degrees from Cora, being her sister-in-law's sister. And Minnie died just three months before her 100th birthday. So she almost made it. But we love finding those, you know, that are um, that make it up to that century mark. And um, especially the ones that are amazing that, you know, have the big families and still live to be in their 90s or, or 100s. It's just, it's incredible. So next we'll go into Timoteo's section. And he was our toughest starting profile. We were told that he was born in Mexico and migrated um, to Texas in 1920. Our researchers were able to add 262 family members within seven degrees, but they never got him connected to the global tree. And they were tasked with you know, finding his death record, but they didn't have any more luck than the descendant did. So they did not find that death record. And I'm not sure, you know, there, there's always something that happens to some of these groups of records, but we're not sure what, uh, why that was not locatable. Our team did find five of the great grandparents of Timoteo with the earliest being born about 1784, uh, most likely in San Luis Potosi, Mexico. So, you know, you definitely the descendants will want to go in and look through these branches that have been added to WikiTree because um, there were just a lot of people added. Now, we didn't find a lot in the records of his families. From what I can tell, you know, they were all from one village or another within San Luis uh, Potosi, but... We didn't have newspapers. So, you know, sometimes we have newspapers or census records that will tell us more about the families. And this time we didn't. We did have little Maria here, who was uh, his granddaughter, who died from smallpox at just nine months old. And, you know, those are sad with the child's deaths. Especially when these things are all vaccinated against now. Loretta was another that we didn't have enough time to find him parents. And, you know, within one week, if it is a brick wall, we don't necessarily find it. But we do have a possible link to the parents in the way of a baptismal certificate for a child, Loretto Coronado and his wife. Um, Cornelia does not have a last name in the record. And all, although the name of the church on the record says it's Real Prendas, Ancestry says it's from the La Asuncion um, Sonora. So that should be the correct church. 
and it also not a super, super common name. So, um, you know, it could be somebody in the family, the record that they found, possibly a father and uncle. So that's a breadcrumb. And we did try and leave these breadcrumbs on the profiles too. So, you know, you'll see research notes where people said, oh, I looked here and didn't find anything, or I looked and here's a clue to the family, maybe um, this needs to be taken further. And so hopefully, you know, somebody can take those, those breadcrumbs up and follow them further and maybe find some more information. Now, this is not a relative of Loretto. It's an incident that happened with him um, in March of 1886. He was ascending the grade near his home. And, you know, this is terrible. And we just, we found several of these, which was really odd. His horse-drawn carriage went off the side of a cliff and on the way down rolled over a number of times before hitting the bottom. But he survived it. Um, he had an unspecified amount of internal injuries and bruised shoulders and face. And he was in considerable pain. But, you know, unlike the previous person, um, he survived this accident. So that was just really crazy, incredible. He was very lucky. Now we have a Sebastian who, of course, we saw was connected to a lot of people. He was born in 1736 in Villa de Sinaloa, uh, Mexico, which was priorly New Spain. It said he went to Alta California in 1769 and on to Monterey in 1770. We were told by a descendant that he was with Father uh, Junipero Sierra in the late 18th century, establishing missions. We know that his parents were Francisco Pereira Iars and Rosa Buena Lopez. Parish records were not available online to look further for his family, unfortunately. Now, Anacio Buenaventura Ars was born in 1790 in Presidio de Laredo, Baja, California, and baptized on the 14th of July. Um, his parents were Nacio Maria de Ars and Maria Monica Aguilar. The day after his birth, his mother died and he was raised in Laredo. You know, and this was just really sad. His father remarried uh, Maria de Jesus Romero and um, but he'd only been married to Maria Monica for 11 months before her, her death. And so, you know, here he was uh, tasked with trying to figure out a way to raise this, this baby on his own. And, you know, naturally, of course, remarried to have somebody that would help. But we did find the, um, the baptism of the child and the death of the mother. And this was a grandson of Sebastian. Now we have Ramon Raymond Lopez, who was a difficult person to research um, because there was more than one person with his name. So, you know, we were talking about this before we started a course and it's hard when you have a very common name and a lot of people in the same area have the, that name and you're trying to sort through it. So we actually had a small team of wiki triers that worked on this throughout the entire week. <clears throat> um, He's been tentatively identified as Ramon Lopez, son of Ramon Lopez and Inez Mendez of uh, Altar, Sonora, Mexico. Now, Raymond is believed to be the father of at least two of the children of Michaela Calzada, although they probably didn't marry. We didn't find any indication that they had married. Uh, Ramon Lopez died of a brain hemorrhage in 1953 in his home. The death certificate recorded that he was 64 years old, unmarried, and a carpenter. And this was interesting. The church register had a column to record which sacraments, you know, the deceased had received in their lives. And his was sin auxilios, which means that to the knowledge of the priest, he had never received any sacraments whatsoever. So no baptism, um, no communion, no confession, no marriage, nothing. In those branches, we found Simparosa Ruiz. Uh, she was born in Spain. Her children, Francisco and Jose, were born in Spain. 
and Isabel, Amelia and Isabel were born in Cuba, and then William in New Mexico, with a family finally settling in Arizona. So this was just definitely a very well-traveled uh, relative of his. And she's five degrees from Ramon. As a reminder that genealogy often lets the skeletons out of the closet, we have Vera Salazar Murrieta. Now, Vera's first husband was Guillermo William Mata. Their divorce was most likely due to the fact that um, he had a son with someone else at the same time as her son. So they were both called William Mata. They were both born in 1940. Now, her son died in 1940, you know, which that tragedy may have added to that, too. That's such a difficult, um, unbelievably difficult thing for a mother. And William was a singer in an orchestra later and an orchestra leader. He went on to marry again. He had a couple more children with Rosanna Reza. He also married Eloise Gonzalez, which also ended in divorce, and then married Amparo Chirino, which he had children with also, and died in 1988. And so, you know, I would just say um, this man was a lot like my father, and he had a big heart is what I call that. He had lots of love to share with these women out there, so no, no judgment whatsoever. And Vera is three degrees from Ramon Lopez through her second husband, Manuel Calzada Murrieta. For the sixth starting person, we had Francisco Felix Rodriguez, who was born in Douglas, Arizona, and died in Riverside, California. His parents and siblings' names were provided to us. An additional generation was added to their earliest ancestor, Juan Rodriguez. And there are clues to take these ancestors further. Um, you know, once again, we're working within the week's time span. And when we do add the generations, we try and make sure that we have it well sourced and that it is, a, you know, a valid proven connection. And so it, you know, they can, we can only get so far in the week, but we do try and we do leave clues hoping that it'll help you get those ancestors even further back. Now, it was a little bit complicated by the fact that there were two Jose Marie Rodriguez's in San Boaventura at the same time. So detailed notes have been left and links to the sources so that you can sort out, you know, the two men and um, see which records belong to which. Now, in his branches, we had Roman Lozano Dominguez, who served as a private first class in the United States Army during World War II. He was captured during the Battle of the Bulge, and he was a prisoner of war for four months. During his enlistment, he received two Purple Hearts, a Good Conduct Medal, a Victory Medal, the European African Middle Eastern Theater Ribbon, and three Bronze Battle Stars, and then the American Theater Ribbon. And here you can see the connection Roman is six degrees from Francisco Felix Rodriguez. And then finally, we had Desiderio Jesse Gonzalez, who was born in Gallup, New Mexico, the son of Benjamin Gonzalez and Margarita Gonzalez. Uh, this line had already been extended to his grandparents by a descendant. According to their family lore, Desiderio enjoyed telling them he was Mescalero Apache. Some of his ancestors uh, were actually expanded by quite a lot. So some of the earliest were Francisco Antonio Jarviso uh, being born in 1779 in New Mexico, which is saying something. And um, Jean Mercia, which is on the Griego line, we actually have being born in 1520 in Spain. So, you know, there was a... Um, some really distant ancestry coming from different locations. Now, the University of Mexico has a listing of early New Mexico ancestors, which are natives. And really for the descendants here, it would be definitely worth your time looking through um, these to try and find his ancestors in it. And I know, you know, we looked through some, of, it's a lot. 
Um, it's a really detailed set of lists. And we look through some of it and it looks like, you know, you're going to find a number of lines that are actually in the indigenous uh, native lines. And so for Desiderio, I would say uh, there's a strong likelihood that he is native Mescalero Apache on several lines. Now for him, I chose an ancestor that seemed kind of indicative of many families in, in that area at that time. Adele uh, Sanchez was born in 1874. His family moved to Arizona when he was about 15 years old. He married and started a family there, supporting them with his own farm. He lived there to his death for a total of 73 years. Now, um, he and his wife, Reyes, had four sons and eight daughters, so they did have a large family. They took in a troubled teen as a foster child, and he was eventually survived, though, this was interesting, by 33 grandchildren and 42 great-grandchildren. And uh, yeah, I'll tell you what, as a oh. grandmother of 12, I can't imagine... I'd be like, okay, put name tags on all the grandbabies because I'm not, there's no way I remember all them names. <laughs> and you definitely have, a, have to have a calendar uh, for the birth dates. But, you know, definitely left a legacy of love and family behind. And then for the relationship here, we have, um, they're actually first cousins. And so that shows the connection and who their common ancestor is through Maria Manuela Tapia. And then whether we support wars or not, our veterans gave their all to support and protect our countries. And because of this, we like to acknowledge at least a few of them. From the US Civil War, we have Jose Guadalupe Gallegos, who was a native New Mexican military leader, a country sheriff, rancher, and politician. In 1854, he served as brigadier general in the volunteer mounted militia of New Mexico. And that was formed to protect the communities against the Native American attacks. Prior to the Battle of Glorieta Pass, he was a union field and a staff colonel in the Civil War. And he is six degrees from Cora Grumbles. We have Ephraim Kelly Caldwell, who, according to his obituary, entered the Army in um, 1861. He served in the 1st Nebraska Cal Cavalry, fought through the War of Rebellion and the Western Indian Troubles. He was discharged in 1866 with the rank of 1st Sergeant. He is five degrees from Cora. And Cora was connected uh, to a lot of people. She really was. Um, Lorenzo Sanchez served as Corporal of Company E of the New Mexico Infantry. He was at Fort Apache when he was injured loading a wagon, breaking his left clavicle. Lorenzo's five generations from Desiderio being his great grandnephew. We have Jose Hilario Chavez, who served as a private in Company E, 2nd Regiment, New Mexico Volunteers then transferred to Company D, 1st Regiment, New Mexico Cavalry. He was soon hospitalized and then deserted. Now he's the first soldier I've seen who was sentenced to confinement for deserting. He was then returned to his unit after less than um, a year of confinement and assigned as part of the army escort that forced the Navajo from their homelands to the reservation. And, you know, so usually, um, Usually there were, were other things that they did to punish people that had deserted. And, you know, and people desert for many reasons. And I have to say, like, I know in my husband's family at one time, um, you know, grandma got sick and they all deserted from their various units and went home and visited grandma. And then they went back, you know, so it's not like they were saying, oh, I don't want to be military anymore. I mean, there's just, you know, 101 reasons why somebody would leave. Sometimes they just wandered off and got lost. And so they weren't counted in the rosters anymore. And then our research started in both the United States and Mexico, but here you can see all the other countries we wound up in. 
And, you know, it should be fun for descendants to see where their own ancestors were. This is always so much fun for me and amazing because, you know, we know that people migrated and people traveled and family members wound up in different locations. Um, but every time we do this challenge, we find people in just all corners of the world. And so every one of those dots is somebody that's within, you know, the seven degrees of our seven starting people. And they really were just spread all over. And then on Wikitree, we're all cousins by blood or marriage. So there's 29,692,862 cousins on Wikitree, alive or not. That's a lot of connections. And if you have any questions about the presentation or Wikitree, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, or wikitree.com. Um, don't forget to like the video, subscribe to our channel. And then while the image credits play, I'd like to take a minute to thank all of the incredible Wikitreeers. Uh, you know, like Jay said, there were more than 50 people working on these lines, and it's just so much fun to see the collaboration that is always going on at Wikitree, but you know, really highlighted when we get together for a challenge like this. And Jay, uh, you did such a great week as a captain. And, you know, of course, we appreciate the organization for working with us and giving us this chance to, um, you know, highlight uh, both of our groups and how they can work together. Did you guys have any questions? Uh, I have a question. Um... This was a very interesting um, um, time to sit here and l look at through all the different um, participants. And I just wanted to, uh, to know if you will be doing this again or uh, will um, this the one and only time that, that you will? For looking at these particular know. ancestors, you mean, or? Or any other ones that. Oh, up. we do this. Uh, we do this every other week. So we have a different organization. Um, the one that followed yours uh, is actually the Genealogical Society of South Africa. And then after that is Kentucky Genealogical Society. So sometimes they're bigger organizations. Um, you know, we did the NAT. Uh, we did NEHGS, so National Historic Genealogical Association, earlier in the year. Um, we've done Northern Ireland. Sometimes they're smaller and more specific, like Kentucky. But yeah, we do this every other week. And so, um, you know, and, and it's all volunteers coming together and doing this research. So really amazing. And you're always welcome, Willie, to join us. Okay, thank you. Appreciate it. That was, this was very interesting. Yeah, I wasn't aware of Wikitree. I, I, you created awareness. I mean, this is pretty cool. I don't know if a lot of our members are, are know about the service. This is, this is like a, like a crowded source of helping people because a lot of us reach uh, brick walls and we give up. You know, we're like ah, for it's I, we've done. So this is really interesting how it's a collaborative uh, project to get people to to work together to, to go over those brick walls that we, we tend to hit. Yeah, and you know, and we not only have projects that are very specific on location. So we have a Mexican project, you know, we have an England project, um, we have notables, we have all these different projects, but we also have our forum and that genealogist to genealogist forum. So I can get stuck and say, you know, I can't find the second marriage of my great, great grandfather so-and-so and give the link to his profile and put it out in the forum. And, you know, four or five people will jump in and go, oh, wait, but is this the record? Or you could try this record set, you know, I have this resource. And so it really is a great way to try and get past those brick walls. And I tell you what, they have broke down um, people on Lucky Tree, some really difficult ones for me. And several of them were doing that, just going out to the G2G and saying, I need help. You know, we kind of got together and talked and they gave me ideas of things to look at and hashed it out. Um, really, really powerful stuff. I noticed that I you have. Say thank you. Oh, mm -hmm. 
I went to your website to the wiki tree and you have like celebrities. So if like Tina Turner and you can actually see a lot of the stuff there, which is very interesting. So, but, but thank you again. Sorry about that. No, you're, I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you for, for selecting us and for letting us participate. And I, I agree with Michael. Um, this has brought awareness uh, to specifically to our organization because we don't, we don't use WikiTree. We um, use Family Search or Ancestry. Those are the big popular ones. Um, but now, now we have awareness. Now we're going to uh, suggest this platform to our members. And um, I definitely can see some of us participating in these challenges to help other people. So I just want to say thank you. And um, yes, just like Willie said, if if there's any other way we can participate again, uh, maybe next year during another week, we can select other people. We have a lot of members that were, and we had a lot of interest um, around this. Um, a lot of members giving us names um, of brick walls or, or they've just gotten started. So I just wanna say thank you. Thank you, Jay, it, great job. Thank you, Mindy, this was, this was amazing. Thank you. Yeah, you're very welcome, Cindy. Our pleasure. And, you know, once again, that's what we want to do is, I mean, this is our uh, partially our amount of community outreach. So we can go out and highlight other societies and, you know, at the same time, still bring awareness of what we can do on WikiTree to help others. And, you know, and, and it is all free. There is a lot. When you first start looking at WikiTree, it looks like a lot, but you know, there's just so many people you can ask questions of or get help from. Um, you know, it doesn't take any time at all to get used to the format being a little bit different. Yeah, it can be a little overwhelming at the very beginning. I mean, but there's always something to learn. Uh, it's amazing. Like, uh, I've sort of stuck with what I was doing little by little. And if you do that and stick with what uh, the tree that you're working on and expand as your interests come up, like I didn't have my DNA there at first and it's amazing the DNA tools there. So you can actually click uh, between people that are supposed to be related to the same ancestors and you can see those matches of DNA snippets. And it's it really is like Michael said, it's crowdsourcing for genealogy. It's a, a really collaborative effort. People who really like genealogy, I'm glad because I need a lot of help. <laughs> yeah, I think we I think when you do the DNA, by... that uh, that really helps. Like my husband said, he was related to Lucky Baldwin, and I laughed at him. Well, he's been gone now, and I did the DNA on my son, and he's related, he's related to some Baldwin people, about 20 people, the first people that came up. I said, what? So that's when I started tracing back his family. So, yeah, it's fun. Yeah, and it's amazing the tools we have nowadays, you know, that we didn't have 20 years ago. Um, and it just improves so much every year. It seems like something gets better and more records are available and so, you know, really a lot of fun. I mean, I know genealogy is a passion of mine, but I love to see more people get interested and especially our younger children, um, you know, younger generations rather take up the baton and, and um, start gathering interest in that and, and researching. So really good to see. Well, I wanna thank you all again for joining me here today.